like uh, Pastor Chad, I'm a Green Bay fan. Uh, my dad knew Bart Starr. No so I'm a fan of have to pray for you. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, even though I, I love Chicago sports too, but uh, I favor the Packers over the Bears. Go Vikings. Oh. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> But let me just give you just a bit of background on me. I grew up kind of like Chad Stecker. Um, I'm 61, so I'm a young guy. And uh, married my wife, uh, met her at Central Bible College, the same place Chad met her, his. And uh, my wife Kathy and I have been married this year will be 40 years. Wow. wow. Yes, hallelujah. And I have two children. I have a son who is, he'll be 35, and he lives in Charlotte, North Carolina attends that real small church you've heard of that's on TV a lot, Elevation Church, Steve Furtick, that's where he goes, and also a bodybuilder, so uh, him and his wife are part of the security detail for that church. You know, they have about, I think, 19 campuses or something like that. It's a very small church. And then my daughter uh, runs a restaurant, she's 30, in Raleigh, North Carolina. Hmm. One thing about it, that both of my kids serve Jesus. Amen. And Amen. that means more to my wife and I than anything. Amen. And as we, we think about passing a baton, I think about our kids. Now, how many of you have children? Yeah. Most of you do. Yeah. And if not, maybe one day God will bless you. If not, you can always uh, adopt a kid, if you will. But it's, it's an unbelievable responsibility, isn't it? Mm -hmm. When you think of your children. And just getting back to me for a second, I grew up in a great home. I'm fourth generation Pentecost on my father's side. So we were Pentecost before the AG was formed. And grew up there in Chicago, very faithful grandparents, great grandparents. And I'm the only minister in the entire family. And you know, you think, wow, how could that be? Well, when I was born, my great grandmother told me that the mantle of God rested on me. Oh, there's Chad. Hey, good to see you, brother. Great. Yeah, did you hear me about the Green Bay Packers? That's right. Good deal. Yes. <laughs> of the spirit. There you go. <laughs> yeah, we died. Uh, we di it, was, it was a tough Sunday. It was rough. It was rough. <laughs> yes. But that's how I grew up. And grew up around faith, grew up around ministry, grew up around family altars. In fact, when my family would get together, we would have worship services. Seriously. And, and then we'd have prayer times around the couches and that. That was my family upbringing. Everything had to be around the Word of God, worship, and prayer. So, kind of like what you heard Chad a few minutes ago, I didn't really get involved with a lot of crazy stuff, you know, as a kid growing up in Chicago, because I was, like Chad, kind of sheltered. But the interesting thing was, I liked to do pranks. I was a prankster. And I like to really mess up people's lives. That's what I love doing. And those of us in our youth group in Stone Church in Chicago, that's what we did. So instead of, you know, doing horrible things, we would toilet paper your house. Sometimes we would throw eggs and do things like that. But God got a hold of my life when I was 18. Accepted Jesus at 7. Committed my life at 18, and it was at 18 when I was filled with the Holy Spirit that made the entire difference in my entire life. Set me out of course to where I'm at today. I was working at my Uncle Nance farm in Gresham, Wisconsin. You know where that's at? By Shono, Wisconsin. Yeah. Just west of Green Bay, Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. And I was working there for an entire month on a hay farm and dairy cattle. You know how hard that is? I mean, Chad, you're from Wisconsin. It's hard work, and I didn't want to do it. Amen. I didn't want to get up at 5 a.m., have breakfast, and you're out there with the cattle, hay. I didn't enjoy that. Come home for lunch, and then back out, come home for dinner, and you know what? They didn't have any TV. TV was my life. I enjoyed that. You know, we had TV in Chicago before cable. We had plenty of channels. And all they did was kind of talk about the Bible. That was okay, but, you know. And then toward the end of my time there, uh, my uncle and aunt, uh, my uncle was a, a Catholic from Chicago, and they moved up there. They bought this farm. And it was during the charismatic renewal back in the early 70s. 
and and care, care, uh, Catholics were being filled with spirit like crazy. In fact, my home church allowed uh, one of the Catholic priests to bring in a bunch of spirit-filled Catholics on Monday night, and they used our sanctuary for services because the diocese would not allow them to worship like they wanted to. They wouldn't allow them to practice the gift of the Holy Spirit and all that. They wouldn't allow them to do yeah. it. So they would use our building. Anyway, uh, my uncle's... Uh, one of his younger brothers, Ron, came, and we were talking about Jesus one night, and again, 18th birthday, and uh, I had sought the baptism of the Spirit for a long time, and I was almost ready to just be with the Baptists. I was pretty close, because nothing was happening, and so I asked Ron that night, I said, would you, I've been praying for a long time about this, and would you just pray that I receive the Holy Spirit, so... I asked him, and so he says, you know what, Brother Rick, I'm just going to lay my hands on you, and you just speak what God gives you. And the minute he laid his hands on me, I began to speak in other tongues, so much that I went to bed speaking in tongues and woke up speaking in tongues the next morning. It was like, whoever. And it was just shortly after that, you, you think of pivotal moments in your life, that was, that was a pivotal year, 1976. And it was just a few months later than that, here I'm at an altar on a Sunday night. And I hear the voice of God. I don't know if you've ever heard it, but I heard it loud. Mm -hmm. In my ear and in my heart. And he was calling me to preach the gospel. And when you think about God's call upon your life, I know we're going to get into this on passing the baton. Within three months, I was at Central Bible College. In the spring of 1978. I mean the fall of 78. It didn't take long after that. Because I knew that God had called me, and God had worked out all the details. I was out of high school. I didn't really want to go anywhere. You know, I had a nice job in Chicago, and I wanted to keep it. But God had other plans for my life. And as I think about that this morning, I think about, you know, what, what God is saying to us here today about passing the baton. We all have a responsibility. I had a great father who passed it on to me. In fact, I brought a, a, a few batons here uh, this morning. <laughs> And, uh, you know, when you think, pass, pass these around, if you will. I was going to have you get up and run around a little bit, but we'd have to do that outside. But passing a baton is an important thing. In fact, in fact, we're going to show you this video clip in just a minute. It was the Beijing Olympics in 2008. Our men, our track team, were heavily favored. This is the 4 by 100 or I mean the baton. Heavily favored. In fact, they're probably the best. You know, our, our track guys and women, they win the gold almost every single time. And they usually set a world record. In the Beijing, Beijing Olympics, this was about to take place. And I want you to see this clip. Okay, here we go. Himself. He's the man that played just moments ago.
See what happened. Tragedy. Do you know how long and hard these men work at passing the baton? You know, when they just run, it's different. But this takes teamwork. And it takes hours and hours of practice. And here you can imagine the dejection. And here the last runner took off just a little bit sooner than he was supposed to. Because the exchange is supposed to be made at full speed. And it's hard. And doesn't it feel like that sometimes when we think of discipleship, when we think of our children, when we think of other men in our churches? Sometimes that's just the way it seems and just the way it feels. In fact, these track stars, as I said, hours. And they realize that a race could be won or lost just in the exchange. And, you know, I'm sure these Tyson Gay and some of these other guys on that at Forsome, I'm sure they just, you know, you feel like, why did I show up if we knew this was going to happen? Why? You know, why? But I realized, you know, as we think about this this morning, that that is in essence what we are doing, what you are doing with your children, what you are doing with other men in your churches, maybe a neighbor. How about you got a neighbor that you have any connection with? Do you have any connection with your neighbor where you live? You know how important that is? I have a neighbor, and I'll just give you his first name. His name is Richard. He's 10 years older than me. I don't know if he's a believer, and I've just known him six months. But in this six-month period, they're away right now for five weeks. Uh, he likes to golf, and his wife likes to golf. And uh, so anyway, they're away, and they're somewhere, I think, in Tucson, Arizona at this time. Well, just a couple weeks ago, he said to me, his name's Richard, my name's Rick. And he said, Rick, could you come over? He said, could you water all my plants for me while we're gone? And I said, well, how many do you have? He said, about 50 of them. Okay. He says, I got a little system. I'm going to shut the water off, but this is what I do. And, and uh, so he has jugs of water, and I have to... When I dump them, I have to refill them, and he has a container that has extra water because he gets all this water from the rain outside. Okay. But the interesting thing was that he entrusted his home to me. I've only known him six months. But evidently, he must have saw something where he could trust me. And here, what we've been doing for the past six months, we've been helping each other cut grass all along, trimming trees, you know, doing menial things, talking a little bit about life. And, you know, when I think about that, I think, you know what? Isn't that what we are to be doing? In fact, there was one, one, one interaction that he asked me about, well, where do you pastor? Because, you know, once people find out you're a pastor, the whole, all the block, everybody on the block knows. So, you know, they watch you and they listen to you. But Richard said, now, where do you pastor, and I told him, my pastor, Epic Church down in Fountain Hill, and he grew up in Allentown, a dentist, and, and I, he says, yeah, he says, uh, I might show up one Sunday. I said, well, that'd be great, you know, and uh, so I, I haven't seen him yet, but I did find out that he does watch occasionally <laughs> our Facebook me our Facebook messages, you know, that we, that we uh, do from the, the sanctuary there, that we put live on Facebook, and he has looked at it a couple of times, and I'm going, Okay, okay, this sounds great. But when we think of, guys, discipleship, when we think of passing the baton, you know, in my family, great-grandfather, grandfather, father, now me. And I'm endeavoring one day to pass it on to my son, Eric. That's my dream, one day. I don't, he's not a pastor, but, but he's very influential in his life. Well, let's get to... The scriptures this morning. And if you have a Bible, and I don't have these on the screen for you this morning. Chad, you were all together, I wasn't. So, I, But the thing is, when you're doing workshops, you never know what you have and what you don't have. And so I know, Chad, you've done these before, you just don't know. 1 Kings 19. Look, we've been, we're going to be in 1 Kings. Look, at just like uh, Brother Chad shared earlier. But this is the story of a couple of men. The prophet Elijah, and then the young man who is about to take over 
Elisha. Elijah was a great man, wasn't he? Powerful man. He was so powerful that the scripture says that in, in uh, chapter 19, it says in, in verse uh, number 3, Elijah was afraid and fled for his life. He was so powerful that he hears a word that was communicated from Queen Jezebel, and he was so afraid of that word, even though he had confronted all these prophets of Baal at Mount Carmel prior to this. Now, I had the privilege of being in Israel, and I know one of my other brothers as well. Uh, it was in 1995 that we helped start a church on Mount Carmel with the David Wilkerson Ministries, the Assemblies of God, a Jewish Hasidic congregation, and it was one other group. And it was on an Angl it was Anglican property of England. And here we are, just down from where that, that whole altercation took place, and here we are, we're digging in solid rock, the footers. I was just 35, I was a young pastor, and I was one of the youngest guys there. And so while we were there, it rained most every day, and so me and the other young guy, we would take these dull, dull jackhammers, you know, and we're trying to dig into this solid rock. And it was not easy. It took us several days. And I don't know if you ever had a jackhammer in your hand, but and, and if you've got dull blades, it's even worse. You know, you're just, you, you, that's what you're doing the whole time. But we endeavored, we, we persevered, we able to get the footers dug, and another group came in, and another group came in, and they built this church to seat about 1,200 people, and all four of these groups use it for the glory of God. But it was wonderful. And, you know, and here, here we were, and as I read this account here, we see that Elijah, he was afraid. He was a great man of God. He, did a, he even prayed for rain. He, he, prayed, he prayed for some awesome things. And so many wonderful miracles took place under his ministry. But he had a fear of women, didn't he? Or at least even the word of a woman. You know, I don't know how you are with your wife, but I don't know if you're the, uh, the boss in your home. I'm not. Chad, I don't know what it looks like in your home. It's the same as yours. Is it? <laughs> I think I am, but when I get home, it's usually yes, dear. Right? Happy marriage, yes, dear. Right? And whatever she cooks, it's exactly the way you like it. I made a mistake one time when uh, we were... We were engaged, and we were, uh, just in a few months, we were going to get married, and my wife cooks this tuna casserole. I don't like tuna casserole. I wouldn't eat it. She took a spoonful of it and threw it right in my face. <laughs> she was mad. She goes, I prepared this for you, and you're not going to eat it? I said, no, I'm not going to eat it. I don't like it. So I learned right then and there who was in charge. You know, I might be at the church, Brother Chad, like you are. We might be there, but at home. And my wife's a sweetheart. Those of you that know her, she's a sweet lady. But I learned long ago that, you know, like here, we find Elijah. Here he is. He's running. And the Bible says that the dude could run fast. Good. God gave him, in fact, some extra strength. You know, he was running away. And he could run really fast. I mean, he would have been a great track star back then, wouldn't he? And you know, the Bible tells us there in chapter 19 that he kind of got upset. He kind of got kind of depressed. But the Lord helped him out of it. And it's interesting, in chapter 19, the Lord says to him, while he is kind of wondering what to do, what are you doing here, Elisha? What are you doing here? He thought he was the last guy left. And, you know, he's ready to give up. You ever felt that way? No one understands my <clears throat> circumstance. No one. But, you know, I found out. Elijah found out. God does. He knows where we're at. He's still interested in us passing the baton of discipleship, of mentoring of being an example to others. And we're going to drop the baton sometimes. You ever done that? You're going to drop the baton. In 40 years of marriage, I have dropped the baton before. You know? 
Have I always gotten along with my wife? Not always. But Chad, you shared something very personal, you know, over this last Monday night. Hey, I've been there. There's times I felt like, you know what? The weight of the ministry and marriage and family. Are you kidding me? There's times I wanted to just let it go and be done. Now approaching into our 40th year of full-time ministry, it's a little different now. The kids are out of the house, thank God. I love my kids, but it's a lot more peaceful at home. But for you, it might not be just yet. And those are some difficult times. And you're wondering how. Elijah, you know, was wondering, you know, uh, you know, Lord, I've been zealous. I've served you. The people of Israel broken their covenant with you. They've torn down the altars. They've killed every one of your prophets. And I am left, and now they're trying to kill me, too. How did you feel that way? And passing the baton, I'm sure he was wondering, who am I going to pass this baton to? Who am I going to do that to? And so, uh, there in chapter 19, a voice said to him again, what are you doing here, Elijah? So he repeats everything he said the first time. So the Lord said to him, verse 15, chapter 19, go back the way you came, travel to the wilderness of Damascus, and when you arrive there, anoint Hazel to be the king of Aram. And goes on. And then he says, you know, um, and anyone who escapes from Hazel will be killed by Jehovah, and those who escape will be killed by Elisha. See, they've had an acquaintance. But God directed him to go and find Elisha. A student. Like a son or a daughter. Like a man, a neighbor next to you. And he, and he encourages him to go do this. So he finds Elisha, in verse 19, plowing a field. Having worked on a farm and had board members that were farmers and people in, in congregations that were farmers, I had a lot of respect for farmers. A lot. In fact, I had one farmer who was a dairy farmer in Wisconsin. You know, that's or, uh, near Wisconsin. We're in northern Illinois, and you might as well say that's Wisconsin, right? And he never got a day off. He had four kids. Never got a day off. Can you imagine that? Every morning, before light, you got to milk the cows, then you got to milk them again in the afternoon, plus everything else you got to do during the day. And instead of him just walking, he had a little motorbike <laughs> to kind of move the cattle where they needed to be and so forth. And his wife and all of his kids were involved in this. It was a family affair. And he would come into church, and it looked like somebody just put him through the ringer most of the time. Just young guy in his 30s. And I'm going, David, David, how are you? He says, I'm, I'm exhausted. I'm just totally exhausted. And I can picture Elijah. Here he is with a team of oxen. And there were 11 teams of oxen ahead of him. And he's plowing the 12th team. Can you imagine this? This is quite an operation. And there's Elisha. And, 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 and here, what happens? Elijah comes up to him. Throws the mantle on him. You know, I don't know, again, if you've ever heard the call of God in your life. But Chad knows this. In the ministry, when God calls, you just drop everything. And in our lives, in the ministry, there are times where we're at a church and we were doing well. This happened the previous church that we were at 10 years and God spoke to, spoke to me a year before that and said, I'm going to take you out of this. I said, God, are you kidding? We have great ministry here. Wonderful building. They owe nothing. We had beautiful parsonage. Everything was wonderful. I was kind of a pastor to this county. I knew all the funeral directors, knew all the people in charge. We were involved in the schools. It was wonderful, Chad. It was wonderful. And God says, I'm going to take you out. He says, I'm going to give you a challenge. And see, in, in the ministry, full-time ministry, you never know where you're going to be for any length of time. 
unless you're Steve Dufresne, who's, you know, 37 years. I mean, whoa! I think the longest we've been anywhere is 10 or, 10 or 11. And it's not because I wanted to leave. It was just God stirring in our hearts. And you know how hard it is to pack up everything? Here we find Elisha. And Elisha, the Bible says, he says, you know what? He ran after Elisha and said, first let me go kiss my dad and mom goodbye, then I'll go with you. All right, go do it. And the Bible says that he returned to his oxen. <clears throat> he killed them. Used the wood from the plow to build a fire, roast their flesh. He passed around the meat to all the plowmen. They all ate. Then he went with the Elisha. Maybe a good question here. What are you willing to do? when God calls you? Are you willing to give up everything? And sometimes that's difficult. You know? I've told the Lord, you know, I don't want to move again. I've moved over ten times in my lifetime with my wife. That's a lot. I don't like moving. And most of our moves have been across several states. This one being the longest, from Missouri in northern Missouri, clear over is over a thousand miles. You only get one chance at it. You know? I'm not going to go back for a second run. You know? So you learn to either sell some things if the board will buy it off you, they're in the parsonage, or you give away, you have all kinds of sales to get rid of things. I kind of felt like Elisha because, you know, that what you're doing is you're packing up and you're leaving. As I said a moment ago, passing a baton is like moving from one time in your life to another. Because, as we heard this morning, thanks to Chad for that word, God has new things in store for us. Yeah, he wants to heal our past. He wants to take care of that, but he wants us to live here and now. That's what he was calling Elisha. Elisha. Elijah was wondering, what in the world am I doing? You know, and even God says, come on, come on. Thankfully, Elijah knew the voice of God. And as I think about that this morning, everything comes down to a baton pass. Everything in life comes to that. And isn't what we long for is when the baton is passed that we want it to be seamless without any rough edges. You know, this baton is nice and smooth. You know that? It's not going to hurt you when, you when you run and it's thrown and that, that hand is there and it's thrown in. It's not going to hurt you. You grab it and run. And I like watching this kind of race in the Olympics because of the difficulty factor. It takes so much work. And when it's run the way it's supposed to, it's beautiful. It's exciting. I know we have Olympics coming up, I think, this year, don't we? I believe. 2020? Tokyo, I believe it is. I love watching this because one thing that we don't realize, the years that all these athletes put in. And just referencing those who run with the baton. The hours, the countless hours. Let's first of all look at Elijah. Quick, oh my goodness, time's running away. Elijah, first of all, had to recognize the need to pass it on. God had to do something in his heart. He stumbles a bit, doesn't he? He does something great on Mount Carmel, right? Challenges the prophets of Baal, right? Defeats them all. It was what, 435, I think, or something like that. And an incredible victory. And he hears this word, and he becomes fearful. He wants to get out of there. God finds him. It's one thing about it. You know, after a great victory, the enemy does come in. You heard Jamie talk about that. After, when God does something in our lives, the enemy is lurking somewhere. You know, it's like maybe when you get out of here, he's going to be near your car or in the bushes somewhere. After a great move of God in your life. I remember back in the early 90s taking men to the Promise Keepers. I've been to a bunch of those. 
And we would take 20, 30, 40 guys, you know, and I remember the one in specifically in, in Pittsburgh. And these guys, my guys, were just weeping before God, crying out to God, pledging their hearts. You know, I'm going to be the dad that I'm supposed to be with my kids. And it just, uh, it wasn't very long. Many of these guys, some of them, even left the relationship with God altogether. Because you know? the enemy doesn't quit. The enemy wants to distract us. The enemy was endeavoring to distract Elijah away from his call and his responsibility to pass the baton. And Elijah had to see, secondly, that there was potential leaders. He didn't think there was any. Sometimes we wonder, you know, we're in this thing alone. Sometimes we feel that way. As a pastor, sometimes I feel that way. <laughs> and I remember uh, sharing this before. But, and Brother Chad, you know this. Sometimes as a pastor, we don't know who to trust. We don't have many close friends. But I do have one, my mentor. He's in his, probably about 80, 82. He knows me in and out. Trained me in the ministry when I was in my 20s. I was with him 10 years. And, and, and he said to me something that I never forgot in the interview. He said, more than what you do here, Rick, as youth pastor, children's pastor, whatever we ask you to do, it's my responsibility to make you into a better minister. He said, that that's my job. And he looked at me, and he was kind of a statesman kind of guy. He ended up going to the district office in Illinois and being the secretary treasurer of the district. Wonderful man of God to this day. And I can call him up, and I say, Pastor, I always call him Pastor. I don't call him by his first name. I have too much respect for him. And I said, I'm struggling with this. And he'll listen to me. You know, and then he said, well, brother, let's pray. Rick, let's pray. Let's pray. And have I used that resource over the years? Yes. <clears throat> because it's important. You know, if, if you're going to help pass the baton to somebody else, you've got to be available. And Elijah certainly, you know, he understood that. And he was endeavoring to help Elisha. And what's interesting about this is that Elijah looked in the right place, didn't he? As he listened to God, God showed him where to find Elisha. You know, he was concerned, you know, and, and there's no one else to help me, he would say. But God said, hey, I've got an army standing right here. I have people who have not bowed to Baal. I have servants. I have men of God who are mighty men of God. You might think you're the only one, but you're not. And Elisha visibly saw Elisha. It, it, it's kind of like the, the transition. If you remember Samuel, as he looked across the sons of Jesse, you know, and he's looking at every single one. And it's like, you know, the Holy Spirit, you know, the hand of God, it, nothing was there. He looked at each one. No, no, no. So he says to Jesse, don't you have another son? Reluctantly. Yeah. I have one more, but he's just a kid. And he's up there with sheep all the time. And when they brought him in, and Samuel laid his eyes on David, God said, that's it. This is what he passed the baton to. This is the king of Israel. And then I appreciate, Chad, what you said earlier. Every king was measured by King David. His life was, was he perfect? No. But the secret of David's life was his honesty before God. That was the key to his life. What? He was honest. Man after God's own heart. And what a job he did in the life of his son. Himself. And then I think of Elisha real quick here. Here, Elisha not, did not necessarily seek him out. But when the mantle came, he was willing, wasn't he? He was willing and he made a conscious decision that I'm going to follow this prophet. And he took the necessary steps to do it. He burns everything. He kills the oxen. They have a meal together. Says goodbye to mom and dad. 
takes whatever he has, and he leaves. It's kind of like the call of God, isn't it? When God puts something on your heart, he's looking for us. And when we think of our life, maybe the people we live around, or we think about our children, I have a little black little picture in my office. It says 100 year for, years from now. It's not going to matter what kind of bank account you have, how many cars you have, what kind of house you have, investments and so forth, but that you are important in the life of a child. And that's always been a reminder to me because one's a boy and one's a girl that I have. And I think of Eric and I think of Carrie. And I think the investments that I have made in their life, if I'm not continuing, not just to pass the baton, but to invest in their lives. In fact, my daughter's going through some difficult things right now. You have a daughter like that? My daughter's a wonderful girl. Oh, she's wonderful. She had a scholarship to Evangel. She was... First team All-State, State of Pennsylvania, her senior year of volleyball. Great, just great athlete. And she's fierce, a little bit like her dad, I guess. And she's not afraid of anything. But she's going through some struggles. Thankfully. You know, we don't talk a lot. I wish we could talk more, but kids today, they'd rather text. And so I get these long texts. And I usually don't respond immediately, but I pray about it, think about, okay, Lord, how can I how can I help her grow? What can I do that I can pass something on to her that she can hold on to and run with? Elisha, he was willing. He didn't hesitate. He was decisive. Think about that. God challenges us to be decisive in our willingness to be used in the area of discipleship. Discipleship what? If you're a disciple, you're a follower. You follow. You follow the leader. You know? And, and that's what God is looking for us. And here Elisha, secondly, he persevered even when Elisha said to him, no, just go away. No, no. He wasn't going anywhere. <clears throat> he made up his mind. And when we make up our mind to serve him, to be used of God to pass on the baton. Baton of faith. When my father died at the age of 46, I'm the oldest of the four boys. The pastor said, his nickname was Red. He said, Red left a legacy. And here we were, the four of us boys standing at the casket with our mom. And he said, he's left a legacy for each one of you boys to carry on. Because my father, just a truck driver, wasn't a preacher. But he loved Jesus with all his heart. He lived it before us boys. When I would come home as a teenager, I was always with the youth group, kind of like Chad. I, I just I didn't do bad things. But we would come, I'd come home, and there my father would be by his bedside, calling out my name in prayer. Conviction, you know? Even if, you know what I'm saying? I didn't want to do anything to disappoint God or him. I loved him that much. But when he left, when God took him, I realized it's my responsibility. Elisha was going to be taken up into heaven. Remember? Elijah was. And Elisha said, Lord, uh, you know, he said to Elisha, I want a double portion of this blessing. I, I want a double portion of the Spirit of God on my life. He says, whatever you got, I want a double. And Elisha says, well, if you see me going up, it, and that's exactly what happened. You see, in order to make a successful pass from one to another, we must live a life in the same cadence. We're like these runners. And purpose in our heart that we're going to live the life. I remember hearing Michael Lucas Smith sing a song, write a song. It's called Live the Life. Not just profess it. We're good at that, man. We're good at making professions. And even confessions, even in meetings like this. But it's, it's outside of here. 
what you do daily that makes the difference. That's what's going to set the tone in your marriage, whether you're single, in your job. That's what's going to make the difference. I know we're running out of time. Let me get to this last. When everything's beautiful and wonderful, this is what it looks like. Now, when everything's running, now this is another Olympics, and this is Jamaica. I've chosen them because I've always admired Usain Bolt. The guy can just flat run, and you're going to see him run in this exchange. And they just destroy us, the Americans. But watch this. It's a thing of beauty when you have a you say both on the team. And in reality, can't we be him? The godly you say both that we can pass him. And isn't that what we are implored to do from the Word of God? We take this gospel, we pass it on so that others, the vision, have it, that we may run with it. God has made us strong in our hearts. But it's also, I, I, I liken it back to Chariots of Fire. Remember, uh, that I love that movie too. But Ian Charlson, who played uh, uh, Eric Liddell, said, God made me for a purpose, but he also made me fast. And when I run, I feel his pleasure within me. God's called us to run. He's called us to lead a life of discipleship before us. By your heads with me this morning. Jesus, we thank you, God. We thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in our lives even right now. We thank you, Lord, for the responsibilities that we have as men of God to lead our families, to lead our children, our neighbors, even in our churches, to being a resource and passing the baton to the next generation, to those behind us. The Lord, if we do it well, Lord, the kingdom will advance. If we do it well, Lord, we'll see results like we just saw on the screen. And God, you have asked us, and you want to use us. You want us to recognize and look for ways, Lord, that we can seek out men whom they, they can be discipled. And Lord, through that, lives can be changed. And Lord, the kingdom can grow. Homes could be better. Neighborhoods could be better. Yeah. Lord, it's not done by politics. It's not going to happen in the 2020 election. It's going to happen when, when the people of God get on their knees, when the people of God will go back to the Word of God and let you do that work of restoration that only you can do. It's when the people of God rise up, the kingdom, because you said that your kingdom it's your church, it's yours. It's not ours, but it's yours. And you're going to build it. Thank God for that. But Lord, you use us in that process in so many different avenues and so many different ways. So God, be with us today. We bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.